Thank you, everybody, for being here. I'm State Senator Melissa Lopez Franzen. I'm also the Senate DFL lead in the Minnesota Senate. And I thank you all for taking time to talk about public safety. It's something that's on the minds of every Minnesotan. And our state legislature has continued to stall on the, on the Senate side. So we are going to talk to you about um, our priorities and our package for public safety. And I'm joined by a diverse group of senators from our caucus to t detail what's our list of priority bills. There's many other bills. Oh. Uh, that are listed and, and have been introduced, but we're going to focus on the top bills that we think is a comprehensive approach to public safety and crime. So this issue is would not only uh, our bills would not only reduce crime, but it would also prevent crime in the future and tomorrow. Here we are today because we're nearly two months into this legislation, legislative session with leg legislative deadlines fast approaching as soon as this Friday. And the Senate DFL Republican majority has brought only one public safety bill to our Senate floor, a $1 million effort that will purchase space on billboards to help with police recruitment. During that debate on, in committee, DFLers successfully pushed to add an additional $1 million to recruit individuals with non-traditional backgrounds into law enforcement. I repeat, it was a DFL amendment that added money for recruitment of law enforcement. In short, the majority hasn't done enough on an issue that they claim is urgent, and we believe it is so. They also haven't done enough to plan for the future with proven crime prevention strategies that, that most public safety experts agree uh, need to work and, and need to be passed. Today, we are announcing a serious pu public safety proposal that will target more than $500 million over three years to reduce crime now and prevent crime in tomorrow. The package starts with uh, significant funding for law enforcement and our criminal justice system and for police recruitment and retention. We also fund proven strategies tr to prevent crime that will disrupt criminal activity, stop violence, and support for things like mental health services, early interventions for teenagers and their families. And we are serious about public safety, and we have serious proposals that we're ready to bring to the Senate floor if only the Republican majority stopped obstructing them. Minnesotans are ready for us to act now. I will pass it on to Senator Bobby Joe Champion, who will discuss the first of our four bills to reduce crime now and prevent crime tomorrow. And this one is particularly focusing on a large part of our youth. Senator Champion. First of all, let me pause by saying thank you to um, our Minority Leader, Senator Lopez uh, Franzen. Um, I want to thank you for your leadership because I think that's important. I also want to thank uh, all the individuals who are standing behind me, especially our lead on judiciary, which is Senator uh, I have to Latch. <laughs> I almost said Senator Lopez Franzen again, <laughs> right? Uh, but Senator Latch, thank you for that. One of the things that I hope that we highlight and that we really take notice of is something that we're saying repeatedly because we hope that you understand, that we understand, that if we reduce crime today, right now, then we prevent crime tomorrow. That's important is because my bill, I like to bifurcate uh, adults from juveniles as we look at this comprehensive approach to public safety. My bill looks at prevention, intervention, and diversion. In the first place, when you think in terms of prevention, that means investing in community-based violence prevention and substance abuse prevention while taking proactive steps to support youth activities and keep kids in school, address family issues if you first get alerted that a young person needs to have some attention when you think in terms of mental health, any of those things that we believe will prevent young people from becoming a part of our judicial system. The second piece of my uh, legislation is intervention, uh, which focuses on disrupting the cycle of violence by providing space for community healing and wraparound services for those uh, perpetrating violence, as well as those impacted by violence. And the final piece is diversion, 
It refers to steps we can take to create productive alternatives for youth by offering youth employment programs, career counseling, mentorship, and mental health. But also we recognize for those young people who might need to take a brief recess and be in some out of home placement that there, is, there are services that are provided that young person briefly out of home and then ways for them to transition back into our community after they are brought back into what I like to refer to as law abiding behavior. Now when you think in terms of this bill uh, that, I, that I'm humble to uh, Chief Author and Kerry, I'm not alone. This bill was also uh, uh, spoken to and, 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 and was, our, uh, was, was a part of the great work of the County Attorneys Association, not just Ramsey and Hennepin County, the County Attorneys Association. They represent county attorneys across our wonderful state. Public defenders who were at the table um, across our state. And then also our judges. Judges voice needed to be represented and they were a part of the architecture of this bill. So it was a cross section of allies and Minnesotans, including community. So when you look at this bill, it is intended to reduce crime today and we know it will prevent crime tomorrow. So thank you for the opportunity and now I'm going to bring forward uh, uh, Senator Latz or oh, Senator Lopez yep. friends again. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Champion. And the bill I'm carrying is Senate File 4195, and it spends a total of $300 million over the next three years, as well as the same uh, $600 million that it's already accounted for in Senator Latz's bill and DPS funding. You'll, you'll hear more about that in a minute. This bill, again, provides $100 million each year for the next three years for public safety funding for local governments. It's a direct infusion to local governments to uh, be flexible for them to determine where they need to use these dollars for public safety. It also funds innovative public safety measures, including community outpost houses and youth conflict resolution centers, as well as providing support for community-based public safety and policing, youth development, and victims of sexual and domestic violence. It, um, like I said, is a comprehensive bill. It is uh, the uh, governor's bill on public safety, which we think will immediately bring funding to local communities across the state by the form of LGA and county program aid, which we know um, is something that we can get out and directly infuse our local governments right away versus waiting uh, till the end of session and beyond uh, with some of the proposals that we're hearing on the other side. With that, I am gonna send it back to Senator Latz, which is a comprehensive bill as well, talking about the justice system and funding for law enforcement through the justice system as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Leader Lopez Franzen and uh, Senator um, <laughs> Champ, Champion uh, for, for your ongoing support. I'm, I'm Ron Latz. I'm the uh, minority lead on the Senate Judiciary and Public Safety Committee. Um, I'm carrying the uh, Governor's uh, and Department of Corrections uh, bill uh, this year. Um, it, like the others here, is focused on reduce, reducing crime today and preventing crime tomorrow. These are concrete, evidence-based actions that we can take now that will have an immediate impact and will have an impact into the future. Uh, the fact is the GOP has not done enough as Leader Lopez Franzen identified. Um, and their proposals, such as they are, are very narrow in scope uh, and reflect uh, an easy to say but antiquated view of, of what is necessary to address longstanding uh, issues of criminal justice. Uh, the fact is that the uh, Department of Corrections bill will spend money on deterrence and on evidence-based programs. It's comprehensive. Um, and I want to tell you a bit about it because it's putting resources into what Minnesotans are thinking about. Um, it includes almost $10 million in direct violent crime reduction support. It includes $4 million in use of force simulation technology. It includes 
over $4 million for the Minnesota Heals program, which has been proven over time to be effective, not only in community healing, but in statewide critical incident stress management services for first responders and for providing trauma services and burial costs following officer-involved deaths. It includes $3 million in youth development grants. It includes uh, providing in, uh, $2 million to provide instruction to individuals who are incarcerated through the state's higher education system. Mm -hmm. So when they leave prison, as 95% of them will, and re-enter the community, they're in a better position to get a job and remain law-abiding. Uh, it includes almost $2 million for Community Corrections Act subsidies. Let me tell you one thing that we have noticed in our hearings along the way this year and over time is the fact that our probation funding is below what is necessary to provide effective supervision uh, for people when they return to the community. Uh, it, also, it, it drives the returns to the correction system, drive a lot of our costs, but they're returned often because they have gotten in trouble again when they have left the prison. If we want to reduce crime, an important way to do that is to provide the supervision and accountability uh, once they're back in the community. So we need a robust reinvestment in our, in our probation and corrections uh, system that way. Um, and so there is not only Community Corrections Act subsidies, but also grants to improve the availability uh, and access to program for uh, programming for individuals under community supervision. Um, there's also a policy provision that would administer grants to the Office of Justice programs uh, for uh, nonprofit organizations and law enforcement agencies working um, to establish community outpost houses or youth conflict resolution centers. And that very nicely dovetails with Senator Champion's uh, juvenile justice um, and other provisions. Uh, so uh, again, um, money that will go into youth intervention, will go into Department of Corrections technology so we can develop more uh, data-based information, money for the probation system, concrete, data-driven, proven, evidence-based programs that will indeed reduce crime today and prevent crime tomorrow. Thank you. I'm now turning it over to Senator Dibble, I believe. I will do that in one second. I just wanted to reiterate that the funding of Senator Latt's bill, uh, Senate File 4039, is, is $122.103 million. So we are funding uh, law enforcement and crime prevention strategies in each of these bills. And the next bill that Senator Dibble will talk about is Senate File 4194, and that also funds law enforcement and provides accountability measures to uh, build and rebuild trust in our communities. And that is a total of 144 dollars Eight million dollars. So, with that, Senator Dibble. Um, well, thank you, uh, Senator uh, Lopez Franzen. Um, let me echo the thanks to my colleagues um, for their leadership, um, both today and for a long time. I am honored to be here to pre present and be carrying Senate File 4194, a bill that's been largely developed and promulgated, promulgate, promulgated by um, uh, Representative Frazier uh, in conjunction with. Uh, local authorities and community members. Um, we absolutely have to uh, reduce crime today and prevent crime for the future and create these durable, sustained, evidence-based uh, research, founded in research approaches uh, to crime and public safety. This bill establishes a public safety innovation board and develops grants that would flow from that board so that we can ensure we are putting into practice the best possible policies and resources that address the root causes of rising crime and give communities facing these increases the resources they need to address it. We have to build trust and accountability between communities and members of law enforcement. And so this legislation will do that in a number of ways. Probably um, most importantly, or among the most important provisions is that we uh, make sure we have police who are ready to respond to crime uh, where and when it's occurring, but also have police that are getting out uh, and effectively patrolling in community and in relationship with community uh, through a number of grants that come through emergency community safety grants. We also have a task force on developing alternative courses to police officer licensure. 
um, we have the ability for more police agencies to more effectively and more affordably use uh, body cameras. And we have local investment grants that free up personnel to do the kinds of investigations, the kind of analysis, the kinds of forensics, so that we can be sure that when folks, in fact, commit these crimes, those crimes can be charged and prosecuted successfully. Last night, I had a meeting with quite a few neighbors, as well as uh, local officials and local authorities, and they talked a lot about the fact that when folks are caught, there's a backlog in the ability to process evidence and charge out those crimes effectively. But we also need strategies that, shown, that are shown to decrease crime. Uh, through local community innovation grants, a whole variety of ways uh, to put into practice all of that evidence and all that research that shows us uh, what people need and what we need to do to reduce crime over the long haul. Whether that's um, you know, making sure we have mobile crisis teams, embedded social workers, uh, restorative justice approaches, uh, you know, uh, violence interruption, uh, and uh, you know, homelessness assistance programs. And we need to make sure that we're delivering, as Senator Latz articulated earlier, effective, holistic, and comprehensive services to victims of crime, whether that's uh, emergency shelter, funeral expenses, mental health services, lost wages, those kinds of best practices. And then finally, um, we have um, uh, to make sure that, that we have uh, you know, the ability to have transparency and have accountability, and there are some measures in this bill to accomplish uh, those policy goals as well. Um, there's more to the bill, but uh, we'll suspend here and respond to questions. Thank you. Well, we have time for a few questions. What's a reasonable expectation for what exactly could get accomplished this year, given that it's an election year, given that all four caucuses are describing this as priorities and yet still a ways apart? Well, thank you for that question. I think we've all heard the urgent call in our communities across the state that we want to live in peaceful communities and safe communities, whether it's in Edina, Minnesota, or in Mankato, Minnesota, where Senator Friends is, is, is senator of. Um, and I, in my night, uh, we have our leadership team all here. Senator Herr, Senator Kunish, as well as assistant leaders are all here because we, we, we heard that call and that urgency in our communities, and uh, we can't leave th this legislature this session without doing something meaningful for public safety. And we can't wait until the end of session. Um, and as a, a member of the Finance Committee, I also think um, today is the time. We've heard bills uh, even today about uh, funding transportation. I think people are talking more about public safety than they are funding of transportation. It's an immediate need, and those are the bills sh that we should be hearing today in committee. We've only heard one bill, a million dollars, like I mentioned earlier, on billboards. Um, and it's great that we want to have um, a marketing campaign to promote a great profession. My dad was a law enforcement officer, my father-in-law as well. Uh, we want to attract and retain good quality police all over our state, uh, but they want to reduce crime. The public wants to reduce crime, and the only way to do that immediately is by passing meaningful pieces of legislation like these four bills are, and they complement each other. So um, we can pick what we think would help our communities right away to reduce crime today and prevent crime tomorrow, uh, because we know that this is uh, a phased approach. It's not going to be solved by one single bill or by one single funding stream. This is comprehensive, and it's about time we start talking about it in a meaningful way uh, so we can get to the right result at the end of session, but hopefully sooner than that. And once, uh, one thing I would like to say that, that uh, t tells on to, to the senator is that one of the things that we recognize is that there's a need for a comprehensive approach, but we don't want to neglect the fact that we understand that we have to deal with the root causes as well. Yeah. Because whenever you want to deal with public safety, you have to deal with the root causes. Mm -hmm. Education, housing, all those other things are important. M mental illness, mental health, all those things are important. So we don't want you to get sidetracked from the fact that we are lifting up because we understand that in order to make sure that we do something meaningful to reduce crime, that we have to reduce it now and prevent crime tomorrow. But that, that also includes the root causes that we are all experiencing and seeing as well. So I just wanted to make sure that we are clear about that because we can walk and chew gum at the same time, and we <laughs> hope that our friends would do the same. So what, <coughs> so what, what is your uh, practical path forward here then? I'm guessing that you're here because you've not gotten terribly far with Senator Limmer and with Senator Miller. Um, 
that's an understatement. Um, <laughs> we've been asking for hearings. All these bills uh, are have been asked for hearings, and uh, many others that our caucus members have supported because there's a, again a very many, many different ways uh, to tackle this issue, whether it's education funding or whether it's mental health supports on HHS. But we know that these bills need to be heard. And right now, again, the Republican obstructionists do not hear our bills, um, especially the ones on law enforcement uh, that we want to push forward to fix this issue today. Could somebody respond to or just touch on, there's been a big emphasis in, with Senate Republicans on tougher criminal penalties and new crimes specifically. I don't know if anyone could touch on just their overarching emphasis on that, but also, like, do you, have, have they brought up anything where you're like, you know, I think that would be smart, or you agree with that, or whatever would be in that realm of tougher criminal penalties or new crimes? Well, you know, I've, I've carried bills in the past to uh, increase penalties, and, and uh, there are times when I think that's appropriate. Uh, but they've come in with mandatory minimum uh, proposals for sentencing, and they've come in with tougher uh, penalties on some crimes. They're creating um, a new crime out of existing law that's already being used to prosecute, carjacking, for example. Um, you don't need a new crime to do that. It's already being prosecuted. Um, so. It, it's a lot of talk, but it's not going to have a meaningful impact on reducing crime today or preventing crime tomorrow. In fact, the National Institutes of Justice has data um, and studies have been showing something that I've been talking about a lot in committee this year, which said that the greatest likelihood of preventing crime is the likelihood of someone getting caught doing it or caught after they've committed the crime. For that, you need enough law enforcement officers on the street. You need enough law enforcement officers to do the investigations, and you need community trust so they'll share the information that they know about who did what. If you don't have that combination, that, that trust involves accountability for law enforcement officers as well. Uh, so uh, I asked in committee on the mandatory minimum sentences, for example, where's the data to support your proposition that this is going to stop crime? They had nothing in response. I asked it a number of times. Of course, they came in at a different hearing on a different bill and promoted something as being evidence-based. Um, but they aren't providing the evidence uh, that supports what they're saying uh, will be helpful. It's a, those are talking points. Those are messaging points. But they're not going to be smart on crime. What we're proposing here is broad-based and smart on crime. And it's on an ideologically across the spectrum. The right on crime folks um, recognize a lot of what we have in our packages, as well as the moderates and the more uh, liberal people um, in, in approaching criminal justice philosophically. Uh, so that's, that's uh, my take on it. I wish th there's plenty of room for bipartisanship here if we have willing partners. But we've got to have willing partners who are willing to do more than just introduce bills because they're good talking points for November. Mm -hmm. Okay, time for one more question. Oh, this package doesn't address it, but talking about the things that they're trying to do on the Republican side, uh, the Sentencing Guidelines Commission. Uh, are you, I, as a caucus, are you comfortable with the way the Sentencing Guidelines Commission is, is operating now? Uh, thank you for the question, but we're focused on the bills that we're presenting today. Uh, sentencing guidelines is not part of the priority list of bills that we are presenting today. Again, um, to Senator Latz's point, too, the Republicans keep putting fake fixes on the table. Sentencing guidelines are not going to fix crime today, and they're not going to prevent crime tomorrow. We need something immediate, and that's why we're making this case today with the urgency that we hear in our communities of why we need to <coughs> hear these bills and talk about a comprehensive approach to public safety uh, that includes a variety of issues and a variety of tools. And that's what we have today in front of you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Appreciate it. She just said you did a great job. You did your performance. Yeah, I got it. I was having a great time. Yeah, I got it. 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 Yeah, I got it.